What up space babies? During the Cultural Revolution, the masses in China were struggling with a very real question. How do we reach equality in all areas of society? How do we go beyond workers' control over production and fully eradicate capitalist thought? In other words, how do we transition from socialism to communism? The Soviet experience taught us that class struggle still continues under socialism. Why? Because under socialism, a new bourgeoisie emerges. As if the old one wasn't enough, but what's worse is that it's located deep inside of the party. Ah, this shit is so fucking annoying. Okay, 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 so what do you do about this? Well, you unleash the power of the masses on him. Now, of course, the masses have been unleashing their power throughout the whole revolution. I mean, after all, that's what a fucking revolution is. But the cultural revolution broadens this struggle. Because when it comes to revolution, there's plenty of people who don't want to participate for a lot of different reasons. Or maybe they want to participate for a little bit in the beginning when it's all fun and new and exciting, and then they just want to go on with their lives. Now, if you're watching this video, I assume you have somewhat of an interest in making revolution. And I'm sure that people in your circles have a lot of different views on this right you got some people who would fully support it there's some people who would be fully against it but then there's also the section who would not oppose it but just kind of ride the wave now the danger is that especially this section is susceptible to just following any political line they're given without constructing it themselves or how about people born after revolution if class struggle continues after seizing state power how does the new generation continue that struggle without having experienced it themselves Although the Communist Party was in control of China, this didn't mean that capitalism wasn't at all appealing. After all, most countries were capitalist at this point and most of China had been, well, really fucking poor for a long time. So think about it. If you're in China in the 60s and instead of prosperity developing equally all over the country, you want uneven development quickly to fan your pockets and those are your friends. Cause that's essentially what capitalism is. How would you go about it? You join the party, of course, and work from the inside. Or how about the people in the party whose job it is to oversee production? If capitalist ideology is still so predominant, what well, would we'll guarantee that literally none of them at some point would just be like, oh, fuck it. Constructing socialism is too hard. Uh, bring on capitalism. And since the party leads the masses on all fronts, this could then infect any position of leadership imaginable. Who can stop them? Intra-party struggle, sure. But if broad sections of the masses aren't participating in revolution constantly and criticizing corruption within leadership, then a return to capitalism is imminent. Now this is complicated because of course capitalist rotors in the party aren't just going to go on and say, I want capitalism back. No, nah, instead they're promoting capitalism by calling it true socialism. So then the masses need to know what true socialism is to be able to contest them. Not only that, but a culture needs to be created in which they can do that without severe consequences. I mean, if if not, it's only going to be a small minority participating in these things. That's why the centralized push from a revolutionary party is still necessary. Aight, 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 aight. So how did they do this shit practically during the Cultural Revolution? In short, during this decade of upheaval, unfit leaders were recalled and replaced. Let me give you an example. After serving four years in the People's Liberation Army, a veteran returned to his home village in Shandong province. Because of his high position in the army, he automatically became the secretary of the Communist Youth League. His task was to lead a bunch of young comrades to work on an irrigation project. I mean, this was some blood, sweat, and tear shit. They had to push wheelbarrows full of mud weighing 1,000 pounds from a riverbed up over the riverbank. Now when the barrel sank in the mud, three people had to pull in the front and one person had to push in the back. These tasks would rotate. But when it was the turn of the PLA veteran, he simply couldn't do it. The army had never prepared him for this type of hard labor. But how could he be expected to lead people in something he couldn't do himself? In the next election, he lost his position. Now think about how empowering this was for the people participating. I mean, it's one thing to read about how leaders should serve the people, but only by seeing a leader in action, failing, and then having the power to recall them. Now that's what spreads true democracy. That gives you both the power and the confidence to spot whoever doesn't serve the people and they kick the ass out. Now if this happens on a wide scale and is still the line that's being pushed from within the party, well then communism is actually within fucking grasp. Because once the masses stop doing that shit, everything fails. And once the party stops calling for that shit, well then you get Xi Jinping who sells guns to fascists fighting Maoists. But 
But I digress. Now, people didn't only exercise their democratic rights within the workplace, but in education as well. In fact, it was one of the main thrusts for change within the Cultural Revolution. I mean, after all, aren't schools what give us our ideological foundation as human beings? Before the Cultural Revolution, education served only one purpose, and that was to have a small minority succeed in passing the college entrance examination. Teachers weren't incentivized to help students become better human beings, but just to help some get high fucking scores on these exams. Primary school students sometimes had to write a new character up to 100 times a day, as well as memorize whole texts about what emperor did when. Shit that you can't really use when you're struggling on the countryside. But yo, shit went even deeper. Language teachers would guess compositions on exams. Then they would have students write them, they'd correct them, then the students would memorize it. Now on the other side of the coin, examiners knew about this shit as well. In turn, they thought of the most outlandish and obscure questions they could ever be guessed. It was a fucking cat and mouse game. The process was described as Chowman drawing a brick to knock a door open. But once you're inside of that door, what the fuck are you going to do with that brick? Worst of all, talking, commenting, and discussing in class were forbidden. So how did that change during the Cultural Revolution? Story time. A high school teacher in the countryside wanted his class to outperform all the others. The students weren't interested in this academic competition. And mind you, they were doing pretty good, just not like the best of the best. But this angered the teacher who called them mediocre. This in turn angered the whole class. They recognized that this teacher didn't facilitate learning the way they wanted to and took action. They collectively boycotted his effort to collect the 1.2 yuan school fee at the beginning of the semester. No matter how many times he tried, they refused to pay. He was was transferred to a different class and when the new teacher came they all paid him the fee. Now in this example the teacher just insulted the class but in a lot of cases there was physical abuse and widespread corruption. So the students went further than boycotts as well. First they organized together in formations called red guards. These sprung up on all school levels from primary to high school. I mean Basef some of these kids were eight fucking years old at the time. I was fucking playing Pokemon Red on a Windows emulator or something. They participated in the OG Chinese call-out culture using dots about, also known as big character posters. Now these were a simple and effective tool to criticize teachers, administration, and also gather mass support. So what kind of shit would they write? An example of a poster was a principal who had stolen some sweet potatoes that the students had picked from the school garden. Cause you know, students were eating food that they'd grown themselves instead of fucking Lunchables. Another poster read that a primary school teacher had stolen some toys and given them to her own kids. The solution called for was simple, a confession and the rightful return of the toys. But going beyond incidents of power abuse, these posters also asked broader political questions like how schools should be run. What a wild fucking idea, students making decisions over their own school life instead of a board directors that never stepped a foot inside of the classroom? They even went as far as asking what kind of teaching material should be used and what kind of students should be produced. One thing that's really interesting is that a lot of students behind these big character posters were actually the ones that were thriving in the system as it was. They were simply calling out the injustice of the system as a whole. Now this is so fucking important, it shouldn't be glossed over. Remember when I mentioned in the beginning of the video that you're always gonna have a section in the revolution that's complacent? Now that goes double for the people who are profiting off of the status quo. But if you create a culture in which you can constantly criticize and revise the system, even those people will participate. Cause it's one thing to be able to spot injustices, but it's another to have the tools to actually do something about them. Now this push for revolutionizing education even went beyond the classroom. Committees of workers, soldiers, and farmers were getting involved in school management. This means you had farmers dead ass providing psychological counseling to teachers in the schools. And workers who were visiting parents when their kids were acting up in school. Now of course not all teachers were corrupt and abusing their power. Most of them just followed the dominant trend. So when a push for change came from the students, a lot of teachers went happily along with it. They made efforts to involve students in preparing classes. Both students and teachers chose a class representative for each major subject and they were the ones who had to get feedback from the students to the teachers. Some teachers even started to experiment with having students teach the classes themselves. This was an incredible beginning of an answer to the teacher-student contradiction Paulo Freire wrote about in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. His synthesis to the teacher-student contradiction was for teachers to also be students and students to also be teachers. The Cultural Revolution was an experiment to put the synthesis into practice. If students would stop seeing themselves as empty vessels just to be filled inside of the class, 
classroom, they'd stop to see themselves that way outside of the classroom as well. Meaning they would become true participants in the revolution on their own accord. But now with students gaining new access to power, there was a chance of them abusing it as well. The solution to this? Again, the power of the masses. Instead of just the teacher approaching a student, it'd be up to the whole classroom to have a debate about one student's behavior. And this is where we get to the story of the ball. The story of the ball is part of a larger documentary series filmed during the Cultural Revolution between 1972 and 74. It was called How Yukon Moved the Mountains and created by two Dutch and French documentary filmmakers. They were also friends of Joe and Lai, aka Juicy Eyebrows. It's fully available on YouTube and of course I'd highly recommend watching it. The story starts in a high school in Beijing when a student kicked a... You know what? Let me let my comrade explain it. It happened two days ago. It was 7 a.m. when I arrived at the school. I saw the students playing soccer on the ball field. I said, the bell has rung. You have to stop your game. Most of them stopped, except for one tall boy. Instead of stopping, he kicked the ball hard. Whop. The ball almost hit my head. I was really angry. Don't you know you're not allowed to play after seven? Yes, he said. Then why did you keep on playing? Don't make a big deal out of it, he said to me. It wasn't you I kicked. I was furious. Such a trivial thing. A student kicked the ball a second after recess had passed. Who the fuck cares? She'd already criticized me once over a problem with a cup. I haven't forgotten that. It explains the thing about the ball. Jian Ming, the student who kicked the ball, already reveals a larger question looming over us. Creating a culture in which criticisms are a constant is fine, but how do we recognize which crits are justified or not? Is that what you're going to say at the meeting? Sure we will. Of course, we're going to get everything out in the open. That way the other students can judge. Exchanging points of view with our teacher helps us work together democratically. Before, we used to punish them. We made them stand in the corner or sent them out of class. If we had to, we called in their parents. We could even expel them. We don't do that anymore. Teachers and students are equals now. We reason things out from the facts. This problem itself isn't so serious. What's serious is that he defends himself when he knows he's wrong. Remember, this is directly juxtaposed to the old way of doing things. What then follows is a line struggle in the classroom. Notice how the teacher is sitting at a student's table instead of standing next to the facilitator. First of all, let's clear up this point. There are two contradictory points of view, right? Some of you say that he kicked the ball after I'd spoken. The other version, let's see, oh yes, according to Liu Ai Kuo, the ball was kicked while I was still speaking, so it was inevitable. They start off by figuring out what the two opposing political lines are. After several backs and forths, Jai and Ming finally admits, I kicked it after she'd spoken, so it was after, Jai and Ming says so himself. Then why did you do it? Why didn't any other comrade say something? And so the line struggle then continues on to the next stage. One line states that he was forced to kick the ball out of his love for soccer, but a lot of students weren't convinced that this was the root of the problem. Since you can control your impulse to play on the street, you can also control your desire to play here. Now his classmates understand the gravity of this argument. As a red guard, breaking rules simply because you felt compelled to do so can lead to a lot of nasty shit in political situations more serious than kicking a ball. Just one thing. Comrade Wen Chiyan also loves soccer. It's his weak point as we all know. But I think he can overcome it. We've tried to solve this problem before. At meetings, often he'd miss meetings to play soccer. Since then he's changed even more than we'd hoped. So I say that it is possible to overcome this weakness. Another thing, we can put a soccer ball anywhere we want. If we don't touch it, it doesn't move. If we kick it, it moves. It's obvious that a ball doesn't move by itself. I say that people are masters of their own acts and that the player controls the ball. 
His answer reveals two important philosophical aspects of revolutionary China at the time. The first is that everyone can be transformed. As human beings are always in a process of becoming, any shortcoming can be addressed through struggle. Instead of chastising Jiayin Ming, saying that he's unfit to be a red guard because of his rebellious character, he gives the example of another comrade who's gone through the same thing, but who's transformed successfully. The second argument the student brings up is that the primary force of change is internal, not external. They can help struggle with Jiayin and Ming all they want, but ultimately it's up to him to change or not. Ultimately it's up to him whether he kicks the ball or not. It's at this point that the line struggle reaches an impasse, with one side saying it was love of the game that forced him to kick the ball, and the other that it's a lack of discipline. The teacher, out of frustration, tries to break this impasse, but uses a capitalist way of doing so. Even though we've tried to reason with you, you keep on defending the wrong idea. Why? Are you going to let us analyze Jia Yanming's problem or not? And especially you, Xiao Qun, you're their leader. Instead of helping me, you're encouraging the worst. All this about love of the game and the impulse to kick which can't be controlled. Do you still think you're right? Now the most important part of her speech is are you going to let us analyze Jia Yanming's problem or not? The teacher is using the power that she has to shut down the line struggle. Just because they say teachers and students are equals now doesn't mean that that's the case in practice. The teacher gets frustrated because the students are defending their line. Instead of approaching it from a different perspective or asking different questions, she starts yelling at them. But just because there's a line struggle and the other won't budge doesn't mean you can then just impose your line on them. These things take time and in some cases a lot of different methods need to be used before true qualitative change is achieved. Again, primary contradictions can only be resolved through internal motion. Now before the Cultural Revolution, chances are that the discussion would have just ended there. I mean, even a bigger chance that the discussion ever would have taken place. Jai and Ming would have been forced to apologize and free thinking would have been stifled, regardless of whether he was wrong or not. But what happens next is what makes the Cultural Revolution so bomb! Wait a minute. You're the one who asked us to speak out, and now you won't let us talk. The reason I said what I did was not to protect Jai and Ming. We've paid a lot of attention to what the others have said. I hope you're willing to accept my way of learning. You're not being patient enough. You asked us to speak freely, so then we can also express ideas that are wrong. If you repress criticism, we can't speak freely. Xiao Qun has paid attention, so maybe his ideas have changed. What's important here is that the two students who spoke up both represented different lines. But both criticized the teacher for abusing her power, even though it's such a minuscule thing. During the Cultural Revolution, people didn't just have line struggles, but also discussions about how to conduct these line struggles. How do you handle a majority versus minority situation? How does a power imbalance affect the development of the line struggle? The moment the teacher pushes her line for the sake of being correct, all the students collectively push back. They're not saying that she's incorrect, but that this attitude won't spark change in others. After all, we all learn in different ways. Even though change must come from the inside of people, there's no reason not to ameliorate those external circumstances as much as we can. The teacher then self-criticizes. I thought the soccer players were all trying to protect each other. So when one of them spoke, I didn't want to listen to him. I was annoyed. But there's some truth in what they're saying. Xiao Qun has paid attention to the discussion. I didn't think his ideas had changed because I assumed he was just being stubborn. I'm in a bad mood and I'm being too subjective. This isn't the first time I've had this problem. I accept your criticism and I ask Xiao Qun not to hold this against me. She doesn't just say, I'm sorry, I'll do better next time. She objectively assesses the situation and then claims that she was being too subjective. This means she principally unites with their criticism and gives the students tools to criticize her in the future when this happens again. After all, patterns of behavior are hard to break through. We often have to be criticized over and over again before true change really occurs. And here's where we reach our final stage of the line struggle. Actually, there are two reasons why I kicked the ball. Love of the game was secondary. The main reason is a result of what happened in class the other day, when I forgot my cup. Mrs. Cow criticized me, and so did Mrs. Tong. She criticized me too. I was very upset about it. When Mrs. Tong told us to stop playing, the ball was right in front of me. Not to kick it, 
meant losing my pride. So I kicked the ball out of spite. I've just come to understand that I shouldn't have rejected the teacher's criticisms. I just wanted to get back at them, and I was wrong. I'll take their advice and try to change. In the case of Jia Yanming, constantly asking him why he kicked the ball didn't help. Even positive encouragement that he could change like others had no effect. It was only when the teacher self-criticized that he opened up about the root of the issue. He uses dialectical thinking to explain his position. Now remember, the root cause of any issue is also known as the primary contradiction. For the longest time, they were talking about the secondary contradiction, love of the game, which led them going in circles. The primary contradiction was his frustration with the teacher and her habit of criticizing students too harshly for things that don't matter. Once a safe environment was created in which the teacher self-criticized, Jian Ming felt safe to admit the primary contradiction behind his actions. Once this was addressed, the meeting was almost immediately brought to a close. This reveals the strength of dialectical reasoning. No political problem can truly be addressed unless the underlying primary contradiction is located. As for me, my bad mood and my own bias got in the way, and I underestimated your political consciousness. I thought that everything the soccer players said was to protect Cha. I assumed their way of thinking about things was all wrong. Actually, their ideas were changing, but I didn't notice it. I was so impatient that I didn't listen to them. Instead, I told them off. This attitude is the opposite of what Chairman Mao teaches us. He asks us to carry out every task carefully. My repressive attitude and my irritability have gotten in the way here. The teacher's confession gives us more insight on the necessity of a cultural revolution. Even leaders who fully supported the communist revolution were of course still ingrained with the feudal and capitalist ideology. People who operated within the party may have not necessarily wanted a return to capitalism, but could have felt that the masses weren't ready to take political matters into their own hands. Thus still perpetuating capitalist social relations by deciding what's best for the masses without them having a say in it. This ideology instilled an inferiority complex in the oppressed and a penchant for commandism in those who lead. Commandism is when political lines are imposed on others without their understanding or participation. This is opposed to the mass line in which a political line is constructed by those who lead and the masses. The teacher in a sense warns the students that her underestimation of their political development can lead to commandism. It is then the students' responsibilities to push back against the teacher but also the ideology governing her actions which is the idea that they're just empty vessels she can dump political information in. Now it's tempting to leave it at that, but in reality, not everything got resolved during the struggle. If Jia hadn't brought it up, I would have completely forgotten about the problem with the cup. Now everyone knows about it. It's true, I did criticize him. When I went to my next class, I forgot about it but he continued to hold a grudge. Now the facilitating teacher did a great job of self-criticizing, but the other teacher didn't really say much here. While it's possible that she gave a longer speech which was cut out of the documentary, we can only go off on what we can see. If you think about it, the teacher was at the core of the line struggle, never self-criticized, or even addressed the problem of being too strict with her criticisms. After all, forgetting a cup is such a minor thing and no reason to get scolded for. But all she had said was that she'd forgotten about it while Jai and Ming was still holding a grudge. In turn, she placed all the responsibility on the student. But even this gets addressed in the theory of the cultural revolution. You see, there's not one giant revolution that changes culture forever. Instead, there are many that wear down the superstructure and build up a new one. So this life struggle was just one of many to come. It led to qualitative changes within the student students and the teacher. But whether the other teacher changed her habits of criticism, we don't know. After all, it's much easier for a teacher to continue their habits than it is for a student. It is only after many more line struggles that this relationship can really be leveled. It is only after a continual struggle that that student-teacher contradiction can be resolved. 
It is important to learn from a revolutionary history. And I can't think of a period that teaches us more than the Cultural Revolution. It shows us that seizing control of the state isn't enough. What good does it do if workers own the means of production, but teachers still abuse their power to dominate and subjugate students? It's important to note that the Cultural Revolution will look differently everywhere because, well, cultures are different everywhere. If a society has a very democratic way of teaching and educational sector, then the emphasis will probably be placed on something else. What's incredibly important and what we have to learn from the Chinese experience, which ultimately was defeated by literally the biggest piece of garbage in the world, is that the Cultural Revolution needs to happen now, not 17 years after you've grabbed state power. It's better to address fucked up ideas of comrades and the masses now than to wait for some unforeseeable time in the future when these fucked up ideas can easily lead us back to capitalism. What were your thoughts on the story of the ball? In spirit of line struggle, drop your comments below. Also, I've updated my Patreon, which now has tears and rewards, all the good stuff. Of course, the link's in the description. Thanks for watching. Peace, Space Baby out.